Good morning. For those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Corey Marcus. Uh, I've been coming to Escada First Baptist for 15, 16 ish years now. Um, so I've seen, seen it through a lot of growth, I've seen it through a lot of times, and this was actually the church that, uh, that led me to Christ. Um, so, and uh, I want to thank Chase, too, this morning for coming up and speaking. Uh, it's not easy, and I really appreciate for that. And I think this is the second time I've followed you after speaking, and both times they kinda, you kind of lead right where I'm going. So uh, I really appreciate that. Um, so where I'm going to be at tonight um, is going to be Jeremiah 31, thir- uh, 31 through 34. That's going to be my base text that I'm reading from. Uh, the reason why I'm going to this text is because I want to bring the Old Testament up for why we even have communion and where that prophetic promise even comes from. Uh, Again, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a context guy. I really like the context of why we do what we do and where it all comes from. So my theme for today is going to be they are looking forward to what we look back on. They're looking forward to the promise that we are looking back and remembering today. And that is what communion is all about. So Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. Look, the days are coming. This is the Lord's declaration. When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. This is, or this one will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors on the day I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke even though I was their master, or I am their master, the Lord's declaration. Instead, this will be a covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, the Lord's declaration. I will put my teaching within them and I will write, on, or write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will one teach his neighbor or his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me. From the least to the greatest of them, this is the Lord's declaration. For I will forgive their iniquities and never again remember their sins. So what I'm going to start here is the context of what Jeremiah's people is going through at this time in Israel's history. Jeremiah is in the midst of a people who are rebellious against God. They're unfaithful. They have broken his covenant that he made with them. He has been called the weeping prophet because his book is by and large very depressing. It's very sad. He has a lot of hard times, and he is continually trying to get the people to turn from their ways with no avail. He is being called a false prophet for preaching that Babylon's going to come in and correct the people because they are unfaithful to God. And false prophets are preaching on how God is going to save them from this upcoming doom, even though they are being unfaithful. Jeremiah ends up being imprisoned, thrown into a well to die, kidnapped, taken to Egypt against his will, and according to Jewish tradition, he is eventually stoned in Egypt for being a false prophet, even though he dedicated his life to God and what God was preaching. Throughout this book, like I said, it's mostly very sad. It's mostly pulling at us to look at unfaithfulness that we have with God, what God has brought us through, and to turn back to him. But in the middle of this book, chapters 30 through 33, there's a block of hope. And in the middle of this block of hope, there are these verses, which I would claim is the pinnacle of the entire book. 
throughout this destruction, throughout this mayhem that these people are going through because they're unfaithful to God, they're being occupied at this point in time by the Babylonians. They're being killed, slaved, imprisoned, and they're being uh, deported to other lands with very few staying in the promised land that God led them to after Egypt. But within this block of hope, Jeremiah points to future days where they are going to be blessed again and God is going to renew a new covenant with them even though they were unfaithful. Something to look forward to. They're going to come back to this land. At this point in time, there has already been two mass deportations of people from Israel. And there's one left to go. The one, last one is the fall of Jerusalem, which all of the people within Israel are condemning and calling Jeremiah a false prophet because he is preaching that Jerusalem, their main city, will fall by the Babylonians because of their unfaithfulness. And they do not turn from their ways. So what I'm going to go through is kind of break these things down verse by verse. Because uh, that's just the way I like to, to do things. So verse 31. There's only a couple of things that I want to point out in this verse. Because I'm going to spend more time in verse 32. The first thing is, is this is from God. This is the Lord's words, the Lord's declaration from Jeremiah speaking through him. It doesn't get any more pure. It doesn't get any more truthful. It doesn't get any more direct than when a prophet declares that something is from the Lord. They're actually commanded, or the people are actually commanded to stone prophets who, declare, or who will say something comes from the Lord and makes a declaration like this and it does not come true. That is how serious this statement is within the middle of this verse. The other thing that I want to point out in here is the days are coming. This phrase, when it comes up within uh, the Old Testament, it's usually pretty prophetic, pretty future-looking, and it's a declaration from God saying, this is what I promise you. This is what is going to happen. But the other thing about this phrase is, it also th speaks to my theme of looking through this passage. The days are coming. They're looking forward to what God is about to tell the people about, about what God is going to give these people hope in, this new covenant. They get to look forward to these days. So verse 32. There's a few things to go over within this verse very first thing is looking at the covenant itself. So this covenant is a new covenant, which is important because it needs to be renewed because the people have broken it. The people have separated themselves from God and they haven't obeyed this covenant that has been given to the people through Moses when they were led out of Egypt. So it needs to be renewed. It needs to be something new. But there's also something else very important in this passage. Is that the phrase uh, that this will not be like the covenant I made beforehand. This is important for us in the Christian world to look to because this tells us that it doesn't mean it's just renewing the old covenant. We're not under the old covenant law after the death of Christ. But it's something different. It's going to be new and it's going to be different. And we're going to dig into how this is different from the old covenant and why it is important to us in today when we look back on these times and when we look back on Jesus coming and bringing the new covenant to us. The other thing about this passage that I actually really love is how intimate it is. Throughout Jeremiah, 
he uses a lot of terminology and he uses a lot of phraseology that points to this idea of a marriage as a very intimate and as a very purposeful thing that God has entered himself into with the people of Israel. He likens himself as a husband who comes into their life and leads them out of Egypt by the hand, as it says in here. He provides for them. He protects them. He brought them out of bondage, brought them out of a desert, and gave them a land that he promised to them. But then the people still turn and they still break his covenants. They still are unfaithful to him. I love how intimate this is because not only does it show the relationship that God wants to have with us and what he is willing to do for us, but also points to God's people's, um, to their unfaithfulness. It points to the heart of the people that needs to be changed. It points to the reason why we need this new covenant. It's because we still break these covenant, or broke his old covenant that he declared was good. They were unfaithful, and throughout Jeremiah, he even likens this to Israel being that of a prostitute. He was a husband, a good, caring, loving husband, but Israel still broke the covenant. Israel still was unfaithful. God was the perfect husband, but Israel still refused to be led by him and to be blessed by him. So now you heard me say this term husband a lot, but it actually doesn't appear um, within this passage and this, of this translation. Most Bibles state within verse 32 that towards the end of it, um, I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke even though I am their husband, the Lord's declaration. So this word in the Hebrew can be translated either master or husband. It shows that authoritative piece there, but it also shows the love and the intimacy there and the purposefulness there. And the reason I chose this, uh, this translation of the Bible was basically to point that out. It's in order to really understand everything that we are looking at within Bible, or within the Bible, within the writings, we need to be looking through different translations to start to see if there's something different that one say, and then find out why that is. Because quite frankly, English is a very bland language. Hebrew and Greek are very expressive. So that's my little rabbit trail for today. So we also see the change in tone here. We see that we're looking forward to a day that God is going to bless the house of Israel, even though that they're unfaithful at this point in time. That God is still going to save the people. He's still going to deliver them from bondage. He is still going to be entering into these relationships with them. But in verse 32, we see why that is even needed. We see that change of tone of looking forward to this day of how glorious it's going to be to the reason why God even needs to make this new covenant. Within this hope, it's still dark, it's still bleak because they have to look forward to it and it still hasn't come to them. And they're still refusing to be faithful to God. So now I'm going to turn to Hebrews 9, 14 through 15. This is going to give a little bit more context to the verse that I'm looking at. And what Hebrews 9 is talking about is the contrast between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And if that is a foreign idea to you or that's something you haven't dug into, this is a good chapter to look over and read over 
to see these very stark differences between the two. And I'm just going to pull this little excerpt out of it. So Hebrews 9, 14 through 15. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse our conscience from dead works so that we can serve the living God. Therefore, he is a mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called might receive the promise of the eternal inheritance because a death has taken place for redemption from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Just to pause right there, this does not mean that the first covenant was by any means God's fault that it didn't work. The first covenant isn't unimportant at this point in time because we have the new covenant. But the first covenant gives us the context of the new covenant. It is still important and it is still what God has given his people to have right relationship with him. And it is still what Jesus had to come forward to fulfill, this new covenant. So our unfaithfulness can be taken on by Jesus and be counted as faithfulness if we choose to believe in him. This verse also holds the trinity of God, the three people that actually make this work, the three pieces of this puzzle that are needed in order for this new covenant to function. So we have the blood of Christ. Christ is the sacrifice. He is the one that stepped forward and was the one that took on our sin and was the one who, in spite of our unfaithfulness, took the punishment for us. So that through the Spirit, he could be offered to God without blemish. And so his faithfulness could be counted for ours. So he could be the redeeming quality that we could not be because we were too weak to follow the original covenant to continually be faithful to God. So it's Jesus' blood that leads to redemption. It's Jesus who Jeremiah's people, Israel, in that time was looking forward to This was the pinnacle of hope. This was the absolute most hopeful thing that they were looking for was this Redeemer, the Messiah to come in. So that's what they're looking forward to. And today is about that. Today is us looking back in remembrance on the work he did for us and for them. kind of like that connection too that connects us to the roots of Christianity that connects us to the history that connects us to the people within the Bible that we get to read about and that we get to learn from and it connects us to these people in a way that we can start to look inward to ourselves and see the ways that we are been un- or we have been unfaithful to Christ and how we can be examining ourselves within that. So moving on to verses 33 through 34. So the big portion of this that I want to look at is God's forgiveness and the use of the Spirit. Within here, we don't see the Spirit named directly but we see the results of him. We see the purpose of him directly that is in our lives. We are told that God's going to write his teaching on our hearts. He is going to be the one that puts this covenant, this new covenant within us. Every believer is going to have this new covenant within themselves. And this is a big portion of the purpose of the Spirit. 
He is the new covenant that comes into every believer and seals us, teaches us, guides us, and convicts us so that we can be faithful to God, so we can move forward. And as Chase said, so we can be iron, as iron sharpens iron with each other. The Spirit is one of the things that makes this covenant very different than the old covenant. Very few people were indwelled by the Holy Spirit in Old Testament times. But now it is offered freely to anybody who believes. It's offered freely. And what that comes with is God's forgiveness. At the end of verse 34 there. For I will forgive their iniquities and never again remember their sins. So looking back towards the people of Jeremiah, God leads them out of Egypt, leads them out of bondage, saves them from oppression, brings them out of the desert, sustains them within the desert, and they still turned away from him, turned to other gods. They became like a prostitute to a husband. But he is still telling us that at this point of the new covenant, Our sins and iniquities are going to be forgiven freely. So, moving forward to 1 Corinthians 11 27 through 29. This is at the end of a verse that is very common in here, uh, in this church and churches abroad, when we talk about communion to be read. Verses 23 through 26 are the, more of the communion verses of using the bread, using the wine to look back and remember what Jesus did for every believer. And then you get down to the point of where I want to challenge everybody today. So 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 29. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself in this way. Let him eat the bread and drink from the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. So that's where my challenge lies today. As we're looking back in remembrance of Christ, we're looking back at what Christ did for us, being the sacrifice, living the life that we refuse to live, being faithful where we were not. Within that light, we need to be examining ourselves and seeing how we are taking communion, how we are remembering this, and what is in our heart when we're looking forward to this. Just like Chase talked about complacency, this is where it can really start to get us. We see how severe this passage passage talks about the consequences of being unfaithful in the way and unworthy in the way that we take communion, the way that we remember what Christ did for us. So with that in mind of how severe that is, my challenge is examine yourself. Examine your actions. Examine your reactions, your thoughts. Take every thought captive. Examine your conversations Examine the people you have around you and ask the question, what shows Christ in these actions, these thoughts, these conversations? And if it does show Christ, how does, it, how does the outside world perceive them? 
If it's in a worldly way, then we need to repent and look forward to how we can correct that and see how we can turn back to God and be faithful to him. We do here, we do communion Sunday once a month. We usually play three songs um, and then something else that's a little bit different is the plates and the uh, juice are at different points of the building. So when you're ready, you can come up and take communion with your family, with yourself. Um, if you want to find a, dark, or a corner and pray, you can do that. Um, so whenever you're ready, you can walk up and do that yourself on your own time. But my challenge there is three songs, at most, that's 15 minutes. That's not enough time to examine your entire month. That's not enough time to examine your entire heart. The examination should be something we're doing daily. It's something we should be constantly looking at, constantly bettering ourselves, and not being coming complacent. This examination that we take right before we step up to take communion, it should be a brief overview, a summary, an abstract of our last month's examinations of ourselves. It should be something that if there's something we haven't dealt with in that month, we can ask for forgiveness and repentance, and then we can seek help from those in this building when it's needed. If there's a problem that you couldn't handle throughout the month, there's thoughts you can't handle, there's conversations you can't handle. Shay said, we're surrounded by believers in here. We're surrounded by good people in here, by mentors, by disciples, by brothers and sisters. If you need that help, ask for it. Find somebody to help you. So as I pray for communion and pray over communion. I'm gonna leave my prayer open-ended. And I wanna, for those of you who are thinking about this, to start my challenge now. As I finish praying over this communion, continue that prayer. Either talking with God about things that need to be fixed, things that you've been convicted of, or just talking to God on life in general, or maybe it's just being quiet and listening to your heart and listening to God and the spirit that indwells you on the things that maybe you need to repent from. Okay, and like I said, when you're ready, you can do this on your own time to step up and do communion. If you guys have any questions for me, you can come find me after. after. I'm willing to talk to anybody. With that, let us pray for what Christ has done for us. Father, I just come before you thankful that you have provided your son for us. Thankful that the willingness was for us to be saved even though we were unfaithful. The willingness was that we would be able to still enjoy your relationship even though it wasn't deserved and that that is freely offered. Father, I, I pray for remembrance. I pray for conviction. I pray for our continual life to show Christ because he provided the sacrifice, because his blood is what washed away our sins because it was your body that was broken for us. So Father, continue to love and guide us.